Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Brave Maker Show live. This is Saturday morning, June 5th, and it's a special edition. Normally, we're live every Friday. We just were live yesterday, but I'm Tony Gapastone. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a Caucasian man. I'm wearing my black glasses in my little Brave Maker studio with the word Brave Maker pretty large in the back, and I'm wearing a green shirt. And I'm always joined with my co-creator in banter, Christina Jackson. Hey, hey, Tony. I'm Christina Ray Jackson, actor, singer, comic book writer, coming to you from the East Bay in uh, Dublin, California. My pronouns are he, she, they. And yeah, this is great, Tony. We're here Saturday morning to talk to some very exciting creators. This is a special Saturday edition because today launches our online film fest. So today through June 30th, we have 31 short films, animations, live, uh, live action, documentaries, feature films, both documentary and narrative. We're really excited to feature all of these amazing artists, one of them being a film called Feeling Through, which is the first film that features a deaf and blind actor. And it was also nominated for an Academy Award in the short film category, which we're really excited about. So check that out, bravemaker.com yeah. slash film fest. Before we bring our special guests in today, Christine and I always have to challenge each other as well as our listeners and viewers about moving your projects forward one step at a time. It only takes one thing, one decision to get your film made, to uh, write your book or whatever it is that you have decided is your creative goal. So we keep our, each other accountable and invite you to do the same thing. Just one thing, a day, one thing a week, whatever it is. So how are you braving your way toward your creative goals? What's the next thing you've done this week to move it forward, Christina? I actually got this from uh, Friday's amazing guest, Kasim. Thank you so much. He just was so deliberate with his action. So that's what I did last night. I was very intentional about my writing. I shut everything down. I let everyone know what I was doing and I just became very determined. And I, I got in bed turned everything off and I wrote, Tony, I banged out uh, four or five pages of issue two for my comic book and it felt so good. It That's just awesome. felt so good and I just I just love what he was talking about. He just, he just got things done and I was like, he's so intentional. Be intentional Friday night and don't do what you usually do. You know what I usually do, Tony? I'll let my hair down, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to work after work and it was great. So it's just doing the work. Day, yeah. Yeah, sometimes braving your way means yeah. you have to do it. Stop doing the research. You just do it. Right? Yeah. Do it. Do yeah. it. Yeah. That's good. So, <laughs> so some of you know, I go into production on Monday for my first feature film. And because it's an indie film, yeah, yeah, it's because it's an indie yeah. film. I'm not just directing, you know, I'm doing location scouting and I'm doing craft service, you know. To some extent, and storyboarding we have great, and all yeah, that. Yeah, we have a great team, but you got to do it all. But this week, I was on the phone. I'll probably never say this again. But I was on the phone with a porta potty company, trying to sell, sell them on product placement in my film because we have a scene where the main character has to use a porta potty. Tony, so, get it done. So get it done. That you was always fun. go above and beyond. So no joke, last night, 10 o'clock, no, 9.30, I get a call random. I don't answer. I'm like, who is this calling? It's, hi, I'm Alex from United Toilets, and we'd love to deliver a to a, a, a unit to, to your set. And I'm thinking, I just wanted them to tell me where one was so I could go to it, just film it for an hour, but they're going to deliver <laughs> deliver one to set. So I got to find out where that's going to be, but we got to port a poly. So, so that's it. Just ask, ask, ask. Things can happen. Just that's ask. How, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, totally. okay. and with that, and those is that details, fun? Like, yeah. Yeah. So, so body, craft service, like those things are essential. Essential. Yeah. If you want to know more about this film, go to bravemaker.com slash last chance. Charlene, Christina is playing a role. It's about an actor who's turning into a screenwriter, kind of loosely mm -hmm. based on someone I know. And uh, Christina plays Veronica, the manager of said talent yes. said main character charlene and she's gonna knock it out of the park so i'm excited it's I'm your first feature film role place. it is oh my god this summer shooting my first feature film tony it's wild it. well it's we wild. have some great guests to get to today who have a lot to share about writing and producing yeah. and directing uh in this wild industry that we love through the pandemic post pandemic because we can we start saying post pandemic i don't know but i'm really excited to invite <laughs> we have returning guest jeffrey lieber and first time guest angela harvey welcome angela and jeffrey it's so good to see you guys 
Thank you. So good to be here. Thanks for having us. <laughs> So we're going to bombard you with questions, uh, mm -hmm. but real quick, Jeff, I realized today you were on, check this out. You were on March 30th, 2020. <laughs> so if you go back and listen to that show, that was when we were wondering like, how long is this going to last? And so we'll yeah. put that link in the chat. Uh, that was episode 56. And we chatted and I'll have to go back and listen because, you know, at that point, I don't think we thought it was going to go on this long, nor did anybody. So that was super fun to have you on the show. And that was right before Christina joined. So that was when I was yeah. solo. It was a lot less, I think, professional and probably good. Uh, at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, thanks for being our returning guest. I was saying this morning that, that we were talking about me coming up for San Francisco for your version of this last year. And then I said... Okay. And then San Francisco didn't exist. I mean, it exists. Right. But, <laughs> but, uh, shut down. It shut down. It was really yeah. shut down then. Yeah, you were supposed to be here in 2020 live yeah. for the Film Fest. We shut that down. Then we waited and we said, okay, the 2021, let's do a virtual online pitch fest. We have our online film fest, which we got a bunch of submissions, but nobody submitted for the pitch fest. And all the feedback I got was people were like, I'm too intimidated. This is too scary. I'm not ready, which is fine. We just turned three. So we got a lot longer to go to build this audience and build our confidence as creatives. But our second guest today is Angela Harvey. And we met in 2013. And at that point, Angela, I don't think you had been working on Teen Wolf yet. Is that right? No, I was. Yeah. You were. Okay. So, but it was fresh, right? Yeah. I had just moved to LA and I moved here on that show. I moved here to work on that show. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love it. And I, I always tell, so huge shout out to our friend Averill Speaks as well, because I got to hang out with these two amazing creative people. And that was seven, eight years ago. And we went to a bunch of films together, laughed our asses off dissected production design and so many things. I still, to this day, remember a really horrible production design film that has influenced me to be better with my work. <laughs> but Angela always says, you remember that film, don't you? I remember that film. I remember the title <laughs> of that film. I remember moments that moved me in that film. That movie, it, uh, as not great as it was, <laughs> was very inspiring. You're right? Exactly. Yeah. It inspired us. We all left going, we want to make something, and, and we are. So, so thank you, Angela, for being with us. And let's dig in. I'm going to turn it over to Christina. Yeah, let's dig in. Well, let's uh, let's jump in with Angela. Uh, we got to hear the origin stories before we get into your career. So please, Angela, tell us where were you born and raised? How has your journey uniquely prepared you for the work you're doing now? Oh, wow. Um, so born in New Jersey, but I was an army brat. So kind of raised here and there. Um, I think a lot of that has, is part of what has given me like the, the, the empathy and um, I guess I would consider a broad perspective in order to write stories and get into the mindsets of different people. Um, yeah, uh, I settled in St. Louis and did most of my school years there. Both of my parents were from St. Louis. Um, so I am a, if those of you who might follow me on Twitter know that like I'm super, super passionate about race and racism and racial justice and so that comes from my years in um, Ferguson, Forreston area. And um, so I consider myself a writer who writes about race, religion, and politics. And that takes many, many forms, including sci-fi and genre. So that's how I got here. That's how you got here. All right. That's, <laughs> short. that's beautiful. So an army brat, you said that is what gave you compassion because you got to meet all kinds of people all around the world. Yeah, we, it, it really helps you just to understand, even just within the military itself, it's so extremely diverse. My first friends were Filipino. Like, it, um, you get to know people from different walks and you're experiencing the same moments, but with a lot of different perspectives already in play as a kid. And that, those are the kinds of skills you draw on to um, write well-rounded characters. So, yeah. That's all right, beautiful. Throwing that question over to you, Jeffrey. Let's hear your origin story. Where were you born and raised? How has your journey prepared you for the work you're doing now? Um, I was born and raised in Evanston, Illinois, which is where Northwestern is, which is just north of Chicago. Which and is where I was born, baby. Yeah. You, were, you were born in Evanston? Evanston Hospital. Really? 
Wait, did we talk about that? I was actually born in, in um just in Chicago. I don't think Evanston ex- that hospital was fully functional when I was. Born. I think it was. I think it's Cook County Hospital, but that's where. I, yeah, I, right. Evanston is where I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so as you know, it's you know it's a it's a pretty weird, unique little place, which is it's kind of a microcosm of everything. But yeah, I would say that. So my father was born in France at the end of World War II and was immediately stuck into an orphanage with a fake name because he was a Jew in in, in occupied France at the time. And um, then was stuck on a boat and came here and so on and so forth. And um, a good portion of my family's story is about the kindness of strangers uh, and people who have who have put a hand out to help my family over time. Um, and so I think I'm really um, super conscious of the fact that everybody who gets a step up has been pulled up by somebody else. And it's our job to reach back and pull people forward along the way. I mean, I think that's just part of the the narrative of my childhood. So I think it became very salient to me uh, and palpable to me. I love that, how we're totally influenced in our life and our family of origin by, oh. you know, what we do and what we're called to do. Both of you have, by the way, both of you have such a strong force on social media, especially Twitter, film Twitter. You all are always sharing great insight and I love retweeting y'all and engaging with you. I'm wondering, can you both share your personal favorites and most meaningful work that you've done? If you could choose one or two or three uh, that has exhibited some of that influence, right? Mm-hmm. In your writing and in producing work. Angela, you want to share first? Sure. Um, mine is, is Teen Wolf. You know, we talked about being on uh, that. I, I got on Teen Wolf in 2012, and um, before I was on that show, I don't think I understood the power of genre to discuss um, powerful issues. Like I, I grew up. With, my dad's a big sci-fi fan. His favorite movie was Highlander. And, you know, we watched Star Wars. We watched Star Trek. But it wasn't until I was in that writers room that I realized. Oh, I write this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, just being able to look at, um, you know, a homophobia story through there, like, but really it's the werewolf who's in the closet. Like it, um, it just opened my brain creatively to, um, to what was possible inside story. And um, that's my favorite. And I'm also like today happens to be the 10 years of Teen Wolf anniversary so um yeah awesome. yeah Congrats. thank you yeah that that show just some of the i still some of my best friends in my life are from that show like yeah that's definitely my fave by far beautiful jeffrey what for you, what about for you um it's funny um uh, it's a script that i'm trying to get made now um which uh, which i didn't plan to but dovetails into the last question which is about sort of generational trauma um, yeah. and how and how we don't, you know, I so I'm born here in, you know, in Evanston and and I know nothing of Europe or any of those sorts of things that have happened there, but I but we we are affected by the things that have happened to the people before us and you take and you learn them as lessons. Um, and so, um, you know, here we are on the 100th anniversary of Tulsa and all the things that have happened, you know, happened since and you were just re- reminded that the past is not the past but the past is the present um and so this this script is about generational trauma in a very weird way it's it's it, you know it's it's not a direct line i don't think anyone else would know that that's what the script is actually about um but um i'm very hopeful i can get it made <laughs> is it a pilot or a, a feature it's a it's a pilot uh um uh, um, Regina King is producing, uh, Amblin is producing, we're about to take it out. Um, uh, and, um, it was one of those things where I woke up one day with a fever dream about, about something very specific and I just started writing and, uh, um, it, it came out over the course of about a month and a half in a way that I, I, I chose not to outline, which I always do. I chose not to talk about it to anyone else because I felt like the minute I talked about it, I would, I would rob this rob it of this spirit of just go just go do right um so every pro, pro every project has its process mm-hmm. and that one was just to try to hold on to the tiger's tail and uh, let it drag me along and i wrote it in about a month and a half and then rewrote it and um it's one of the favorite things i've ever done and now i gotta see if i can get it made 
That's exciting. Is that is so exciting. I hope you get that made. Uh, going back to lessons, I'm going to put this to Angela first. What are some of the lessons since entering your first writer's room? What are the top lessons that you've learned actually in the field? Oh, wow. Um, top lessons in the room itself or? Like, like in life as a writer, like since you found yourself in your first writer's room, what you thought you knew compared to what life is actually like as a writer working on these shows, trying <laughs> to get stories told, trying to get them made. What have you learned along that process? I heard you guys talking a little bit in the back room about some of the challenges. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, bleed, Angela, bleed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the biggest lesson, and that's not related to development or trying to get stories made, which, you know, best of luck, Jeff, sending you. <laughs> I, Really hope that one gets made. You got some power, powerhouse team. Um, it's simplify, 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 simplify. Like we always, we, we get up with big concepts, big ideas. I, I, I like to do world building and um, you know, like I said, I like sci-fi, I like genre and I like lots of characters and like it, it's got these deep themes of race, religion and politics and it, just so you know what, just tell me a story, everybody. And it really does kind of, it runs from story, it runs from your day to day life. Just like, simplify. Before we were talking about, well, Angela and I were talking about uh, um, trying to get deals made and all those sorts of things, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that reminded me that the thing it took me about 10 years to do is to fall in love with the, the work. Because everything else, you have so little control over. Like you have so little control over how long a deal is going to take, and you know, are you going to get this much money or that much money, and does that matter to you, and is it important, and who are you going to work? All these things are out of your control. And it took me a decade to not to just fall in love with the job, right? The and treating it like a job. Like when I'm not in a room. I, I I have office hours. I go to I go to my coffee shop when I can go to a coffee shop, and I think I can go to. <laughs> I go at ten a.m. and I sit down. and I work from ten to about twelve thirty, and then I take a little break, and I'll, and then I'll make from two to about three thirty another time that I work, and that's my day, right? Those four and a half hours, and I make I may write great stuff, I may write terrible stuff, I may write nothing, but I'm my butt's in the seat for those hours. Because if I can fall in love with that, I have control of that, right? Mm -hmm. I used to be an actor. And again, I felt totally out of control as an actor. I couldn't cast myself. I thought I should get every part even when they were not for me. I, you yeah. know, when people rejected me, they were rejecting me. Like literally you, you are not what we want. It was horrible. And at least this thing we all do now, I have some control. And so, so that's it. Falling in love with the work. Like falling in love with the things that I can control is the biggest thing that has made this less painful for me because it's kind of painful yeah <laughs> I, I love that know. you know we it, earlier we were talking about development hell and like i'm i'm newer to that world of development like staffing i've been doing um yeah so for almost 10 years now but development has been about two and so i don't know that i've learned the big lessons on on that side yet um, but I've learned that you can't, you don't have control. <laughs> Learn that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say, I would say the thing on that side that, that at some point you come to a point where they all have opinions. Everybody, I, I think it's my, it's my pinned tweet at the moment, which is the, the lesson I learned was that you think that you want to figure out what they want and what they want is for you to tell them what you're going to do. Not with, not with, um, pride or, uh, arrogance but to say look we're going west the gold is west and we're going west. the company is that if you don't want to go west hire somebody else right but i'm here to tell you that that the answer is is that we're going to head west and either link hands and trust me or find someone else because i spent 10 years really trying to make everybody happy and that mm -hmm. sucked mm -hmm. yeah i can't even imagine that <laughs> 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 so that question I have next for you 
is what are some, and maybe we can tie this together with 2020 and 2021, like the learnings, you know, because it's a different world. Everyone says it is. I don't know if a lot of things have changed inside the industry, but they are, right? With distribution and how things are happening and that kind of thing. But I would, I'd love to hear you kind of a two-part. What are some things you learned over the last year and a half that you think going forward will stick when it comes to writing, writer's room, getting things made? And then what are some things you think you'd like to see done away with like what is the industry just failing i know angela does a great work with the um the writers uh, the inclusion writers group that you're doing i love you talk about that but and what's go what's going right right now so learnings things that you learned over the past year and a half things you think might be sticking and then what's going good and what needs to go away in regards to writing and producing tv and film um i think that uh a couple things on the inclusion front, you know, um, a lot of people are, the conversations are different. So um, we haven't really changed behavior yet, but um, the conversations are different and um, hopefully we keep moving forward on that front. Um, but to the COVID of it all, um, that was an eye opening thing to me. And it was actually really um, pertinent to Indy filmmakers as well. Like Tony, you mentioned our friend Avril earlier, um, who was making movies during COVID and it, um, it really highlighted to how um, passionate we get about our work and how it comes to take over as the most important thing. And I think that um, COVID has taught us that it's just really not. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just need to stay aware of that and keep remembering that um, we're the most important thing. Our our collaborators, our, mm. our coworkers, our friends, that's the most important thing. And um, so, you know, Hollywood, the industry is an industry, you know, it's always gonna put the dollar first, but um, as creatives, as showrunners, as producers, we need to remember what's really important. I, I had, um... I don't know why it, it, it coincided with COVID, but you know, so when I, when I moved from Chicago to Hollywood, I, I literally knew nobody, right? I had nobody who, and so my story has, has always um, come from that concept, right? And I was doing a, a talk like this and I realized that there's a piece of it that I have, that I have neglected up until now, which is this, that, so I, I moved out here. I got an agent from Chicago. I came out here. My agent was immediately fired. I realized my agent never told the rest of the agency that I was existed there. I was hip hop and no one cared. They fired me. I spent eight months in the wilderness. Uh, I met a bunch of people. I met a new agent who then said, I'm leaving my agency. And then I ended up back at the same place, right? So I ended up, the guy who fired me, I ended up in an elevator with being reintroduced to him and he, him saying, I love you, you're fantastic. And he has no clue that he fired me eight months before. <laughs> so there's a piece in that story, which is the reason I met my new agent was I got invited to a party and I went to the party and I met a bunch of people and I met a person who gave that agent the script. I got invited to that party because I look a certain way because I, I think I looked like a guy who was a writer in Hollywood at the time. I looked like a, young Jewish dude who from the Midwest who wrote. And if I had looked differently, I don't know that I'd ever been invited, been invited to that party. And so that piece of the story, that piece of how privilege worked for me was masked to me until this last year. Um, not that I took it for granted, but I just didn't understand it. Something about this last year caused me to be able to identify that moment as being seminal and pivotal and worth talking about, which is that um, that's how I think what Angela's saying, how we need to change, which is we need to, we need to continue to expand the, expand the aperture so that more people are in the space to be met. And therefore you then f are able to rise based on mostly ability and a lot of other bullshit, but mo but at least on ability. <laughs> I, have, if I had not been invited that day, I would have not met that person who would have not given my script and I would have not gotten all the pieces that it would have fallen in place. And some piece of that story comes from the way my skin suit fit the narrative of the way Hollywood worked at the time. And that's the important piece that we have to find a way to tease apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Because so many nebulous, so much of the way these things work are, are based on things like that. Things that it takes 
um, that are that are too obvious to notice, <laughs> too upfront to notice. And so you have a lot of people who are very well-meaning and think that they're part of the solution who are missing those obvious cues that they are perpetuating. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and, and the flip side of that coin is, you know, everybody needs to be interested in everybody else's stories. And I don't know that we're there yet either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, I don't know how to deal with that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a great that's a great point. How do we become interested in each other's stories? I think Angela, for you, maybe you naturally gravitate towards that because you are an army brat. So everyone around you is always other people's stories, never just immersed kind of in your world and your city. Like it was always a variety of people. Maybe that became the norm. I don't know. That would be great. How do we care about everybody's stories, not just our own? I'll think about that. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'm like, you got yeah, that right? because I, <laughs> I will teach workshops on it once you figure it out. <laughs> you know what's, what's funny is that you know Angela, I, I do a lot of Twitter stuff, and one of the things I find about Twitter that is difficult, um, but is a symptom of the larger thing is I think we have come to impute. I think is the right word. We 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 assume the worst about a lot of people, and we assume the worst about we. Certainly on Twitter, people often take immediately the worst possible intentions of people. And I yeah. think we have to find a way to claw back from that and to at least yeah. have more space or more time before we pull the trigger where we assume that, that people's um, intentions are bad. Because it, it will allow more time for empathy and space and, and uh, potentially understanding and therefore stories can then come out as, as if we can if we can find a way to give people more time and space before we sort of bury them. I love yeah. that. Are you suggesting that we listen to each other? Yeah, I think that's what, I think that's what Jeff just said. That's he said incredible. listen. He did. Even on social media, we need to listen. <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey, I don't know. That's wild. Yeah. It's a wild idea. In the real life and in <laughs> digital life, it's, it's hard to because when you were talking earlier i was thinking of that phrase how people aren't thinking about you as much as you think they're thinking about you right they're thinking about themselves and in this business especially how so much anxiety you know we'll talk about pitching in a little bit but uh, we're always thinking other people have all these opinions and they are to some extent but not as much as they're just thinking about themselves and what other people are thinking about themselves so it's such a wild mind boggle you know to exist in this space and to be a creative and to engage in the dialogue online and uh to get work done i mean all of these things always continually coming at us man i so thank you both for putting your stuff out there and for engaging yeah. and for poking and calling things out and yeah. you know giving us the tips and the tricks and things that are working for you online i, I love it i think it's awesome all right next question our next question, uh, Angela, can you share your best practices, highs and lows, and favorite things about pitching? Do you enjoy pitching? I do not. Yeah, I saw you. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> I saw um, that coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the last pitch I did, I got so nervous, my glasses fogged up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just, it was like the heat, I could feel the heat just coming up and coming up. And then, yeah, it was on Zoom, obviously, because COVID. And, and then my, I just could see like little, <laughs> it's like, oh, man. No, I, I feel like what Angela is saying is what we all felt, Tony, when you when you threw out the pitch fest and it was like we, everyone immediately clammed up like, oh, my God, uh, no, I can't do this. And then no one's So, Angela, how do you overcome that? Do you overcome that? No, you take your glasses off and keep going. <laughs> you, <laughs> I don't know that I'll ever get used to it. Maybe I will. Maybe um, I know a lot of people, lot of people uh, memorize their pitches and perform it like a monologue. Um, that's not something I can do. Even when pitches were in person, I would still bring in my notes and just and just read it and like and, and trust that what I had put on the page was enough of a story to keep people engaged and it's worked I, I i've sold i've sold several ideas so um I, I guess it's just find the way that works for you find the way that you can um stay present and engaged and not necessarily put pressure on yourself to make it a show because 
Um, that just might be too much. That might be over the line. It was for me. I like that. It kind of goes back to what Jeffrey was saying about loving what you do. If you love what you do, put that love into your work. When you go and present the work, you don't have to go and do a song and dance. You can just present the story that you want to tell. And if it's good, you know, it'll sell. That's pretty perfect. Uh, okay. So love what you do and just present the information and uh, take your glasses off if they fog up. Got it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And then maybe you can't right. see the people either. That maybe helps. <laughs> yeah. just blurry. Is pitching better during COVID? Has that changed for you guys? Can we? I I, I love pitching. Uh, it's the actor oh. in me. So I so so I, I treat it as like the, um my advice is to treat it as the as the best um dinner dinner party story you can tell, right? So you have to, so it's, it's basically somebody has turned to you and says, Hey Jeff, tell that story about, right. And then I, and I try to do it in 15, 20 minutes and just try to tell the story. Like, okay, so there's this, there's this girl and, and try to just <laughs> hand over my passion for the story, the reason it's good, all the cool moments to the, and then get out in 20 minutes because I think some people want, feel like they have to tell you everything. Mm-hmm. And the goal is just to tell you the primal stuff and then say, let's have a conversation, right? And then you'll, you you got to have the answers when they ask the questions, but you really want to engage them as a way, you know, the worst pitches I've ever been a part of have been 45 minutes and they've got pictures and this and that and the other thing. The truth of the matter is you're going to sell the pitch in the first two or three minutes. You're either done then or you're not. And everything after that is about solidifying. So it's really like, is it clear? Is it primal and is it interesting? That's really all it is. Um, but uh, Zoom pitching sucks. Okay, yeah. It's just awful because it's like I mean, there's no energy and there's no, it's hard and are you talking on top of each other and oh shit, it's not my turn, you know. The worst is when yeah. everybody's on mute but you. Oh god, <laughs> you have no idea. Like, yeah. it, and sometimes there's uh, there's somebody an executive who's really nice and wants to you know, give you their encouragement non-verbally, but most of the time it's just a bunch of squares. And the <laughs> brutal. Oh, Angela, you just painted the most brutal picture. <laughs> picture during COVID. Brutal. But do, you think, it's, do you think it's going to go away though, or will it stay? I think it's going to stay. I think it's going to really? be, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to always Hybrid. stay. I think some folks will, it'll be optional here and there. But one of the good things is like, it used to be that if, if I had a, me had, had a meeting and I didn't get invited to go to Burbank and meet on the Warner Brothers lot, I'd be like, oh, this isn't a real meeting. Now I'm like, I don't want to drive to Burbank and go to the Warner Brothers lot. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. So that's an improvement. Yeah. That is, and that's for sure for general meetings, like the meetings that you have just to go say hi to, to folks. Like I'm never driving to Santa Monica for a general again. <laughs> Angela, I'll make you a deal. I'll take your Santa Monica meetings and you can take my Valley meetings and we'll be set. <laughs> I'll wear the glasses. It'll be great. <laughs> I got and, it. I'll talk to you about Everson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. I had the benefit because I'm not in LA. So I had the benefit this COVID season of pitching. I had a general on Zoom. I had a pitch for my animated show on Zoom. And so I felt in some way the elevated opportunity invitation to kind of feel level in the playing field of the entertainment industry that you don't just have to be in LA. Now I know eventually someday that's probably going to be a reality because I want to show run and create television. But for this past year and a half, it was really fascinating to go, oh, cool, I'm pitching from my living room, hoping my kids don't burst in in a tantrum or without clothes or something. You know what I mean? So that was really, really engaging. I wonder, can you talk about for all of our future pitchers out there, just some best practices and, you know, my very first pitch, I just Googled everything and I've heard you all talk about stuff on podcasts. And so I was really prepared. Like I was prepared to talk to everything personal <laughs> that possible. Like if they asked me about my first sexual experience, if they asked me about my family of origin, what am I going to say? Because those are some of the things I've heard that people ask. And I was surprised how it was really asking questions about me first. And then they would go, oh, 
you your 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 parents divorced and then your mom remarried and adopted kids talk about that what was it like how did you feel towards your mom i was like um okay you know things i didn't expect and then it was oh because we have this show about blah 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 and that was awesome but do you have any other kind of stories or things that either threw you off things to prepare for how could someone get into a general and feel like they're just ready to go to the best that they possibly can because you're never fully ready we just did a workshop on this for um, the community building outreach of um, the, the group that I work with. I'm co-chair of the think tank for inclusion and equity. And, um, you know, we did this whole worksheet, which I can send to you, Tony, to, to send to the group about um, how to break down your personal story and how to have three to five stories that you want to tell. And um, like from, <laughs> from what I learned, um, from some of the diversity programs, well-meaning, great programs that are actually doing, you know, great work, but they would tell writers from marginalized communities to go into these general meetings and um, tell their most traumatic stories mm -hmm. as a way to bond with these executives. And so now you're sitting there like a, a puddle dealing with your trauma instead of actually like going in with a plan. Like these are the stories I can tell there. And, and if someone asks you, about a, a situation you're not ready to talk talk about, how to handle that. If someone, um, you know, is going into microaggressive territory or harassment territory, how do you handle that? Um, so I get, you know, best practices would be prepared with those three to five stories that you are willing and ready and able to tell, and also go in with like a bunch of questions of your own. You know, be curious about them as a person, them as a company, and. Um, also, just kind of chill. Just go in there and have a conversation and um, know that sit in your own power while you're there. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, I, I, um, I totally agree. I, I, I think it's important because, you know, there are only like 10 stories. You know, people falling in love, people falling out of love, people, you know, dying and growing old and all, you know, and everything else is about voice. And so you're really just trying to sit in that room and say, "Hey, this is my voice again. This is this is why you'll you'll choose me to tell you to go west or east or north or south." Um, and I don't. And, and as Angel says, I don't think that has to come from trauma. That just has to come from you being able to be in touch with your humanity um, on some level. And so and to and to communicate that humanity. I mean, again, a lot of my a lot of my, when I first got to LA and, and people would meet me, I, I came from this sort of Midwest mentality of, uh, of struggling to feel good enough. And I think I told a lot of stories about that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we would, I would connect with people on that level and they, they felt like, oh, I could understand that when I, uh, so when I, I got hired to write Tuck Everlasting, which was one of the movies I wrote before I became a TV guy. And that's a story about a young girl um, who feels as if she she is being her whole life is passing her by too quickly and so and and she has no control and I felt that I I, I was in that place and I and so when I went to pitch that and when they gave me the job I, I was able to say this is why the story is personal to me right um, even though I'm I'm not from that period and I'm not a young girl and all the things that I'm not um, I was able to on some level. Um, start that conversation with them and say, hey, I do understand. I do have that kind of humanity in me. And so that's, I think, really what you're trying to do. But I, but I totally agree with Angela. To, to do sort of trauma first feels like, I don't even know you. We just met. You can <laughs> right? give me a glass of water. And now I'm going to tell you about it. Yeah. That's a lot. It was bad advice. Yeah. That's bad advice. <laughs> yeah. But Angela, that was that was phenomenal advice. You said two things: sit in your own power, and be chill. Like that's that's perfect. Go into any room with that advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they called you in. Like that's the thing. Like once you got the meeting, you got the meeting. They yeah. want to see you. You don't have anything else to prove. Yeah. So, that's good. Yeah. Same thing for actors too. I always tell actors when you get an audition, they at least liked your headshot <laughs> or your agent <laughs> sold you on it. Go in there and just be confident. Tell you like they want you. Yeah. They're interested. 
I think that personal story thing too, you know, we are a vulnerable people as artists. And if you're starting to feel vulnerably uncomfortable, that's a good sign. Just go with your, I'm trying to tell myself, go with my gut a lot more. If I'm feeling uncomfortable, I'm going, you know, I'm going to ask you about filmmaking in a couple of minutes, but I'm on Monday, I start my first feature and I'm just telling myself like my, my whole objective is go with my gut. If I don't feel comfortable about a take or a scene or moving forward, it's like, I have to go with my gut because I often don't. And then I kick myself afterward when I don't get the shot or I'm in post and I go, ah, oh, I knew I should have. So I think in the same way as we pitch, you know, we're, I come from a sort of a, uh, a faith not sort of i come from a faith background that can be very dogmatic borderline abusive at times with how things are taught and said and i've had to relearn and deconstruct a lot of my relationship to the industry to storytelling and it's in, impacted my freedoms and there's so much about how i my point of view of the world has been impacted by all these things i shouldn't do and i'm trying to learn to be present in my body as a creator and as a storyteller and it's really beautiful work but it's super hard but i think in <laughs> pitching that ability to tell your story is just like what a gift what a privilege but also like you we hold it you know in a way that's like what are people going to say about it it's just gosh like that's why therapy needs to go hand in hand with creativity i think <laughs> we need these support systems uh i don't know if you want to say anything about that before we ask your next question but go uh, for i it. do want to say to actors 99.95% of the time, the reason you didn't get the job is not your fault. Yeah. And so yeah. let that go. Like, it's not your fault. You, you know, you, you have, you have this color hair. We need that color hair. You're this tall. We need that tall. You have this accent. We, it's not your fault. Just go be you. Mm -hmm. Or even yeah, the thing that always freaks, tweaks with my brain. is like when you're right, you're watching the, um, the casting videos and somebody's glitches. Oh. And then like, I'm the one who's like, I'm gonna keep trying, I'm gonna keep trying. But like, your your video might have glitched. Like, <laughs> anything could have happened. Oh, that's good. <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna launch into some talk about. We probably got about ten or fifteen minutes of your time. I could talk. I don't know, Christina and I. We could probably bend your ear for quite a long time. This is so and super inspiring. <laughs> we are today launching our online uh, Brave Maker Film Festival, y'all. We have 31 films available to you. I'm gonna quickly show you the trailer to said film festival, and then we're gonna talk to Jeffrey and Angela about what you can be doing as you make your works and get your stuff out into the world. So take a look. So go check it out, bravemaker.com slash film fest. We're really excited about all these great makers out there, y'all. Yeah, it's going to be absolutely awesome. I got to see a lot of these. What? Yeah, cool. there's so much diversity. In yeah, these stories are so wild. I, I love them. You got to check them out. These are voices and characters and stories that you've never seen and heard before. We just went through them for the programming to really bring for the best and the brightest and the most exciting and invigorating and inspiring. So yeah, check out the films in our film fest. So what would you two say to the makers out there? And I'll, you know, selfishly ask for your, as I roll cameras on Monday, what are some things that filmmakers and aspiring TV writers should be doing as they produce their work today mm -hmm. to make and brave, we always say brave your way, toward making a living in this creative industry? What are some things that people could be doing as they're making their work or be aware of? And things you might say I should and shouldn't do on set <laughs> for the next two and a half weeks. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll tackle the should and shouldn't do on set because that's do it. here. Um, <laughs> I, I would give yourself space to hang out with your cast mm. and not just like, um, 
be all business with them the whole time. Like, cause I think some of the, some of the best stuff that, and I have, you know, you're ahead of me doing a feature. I haven't done a feature yet. But like <laughs> when um, I did a short right before pandemic and it was like, it was in the green room. Folks were in the chair that some of the best pieces of conversations, some of the best pieces of work happened in those moments, with, like in between karaoke or whatever. So, um, yeah, trust your crew and let yourself hang out with the cast a little bit. That's good. Thank you. I got to brag. I get to hang out with Allie Mills, who played Norma Arnold on the first iteration of Wonder Years because they're rebooting it this year, right? But I got to cast this icon of my childhood and so i'm really excited to hang out with her so that's a good one angela thank you uh, it's funny uh, angela one of the things i do when, when i start a new show is i i try to email the cast and say like what are your talents what are your what are your quirks what are your you know because you find out like someone's like oh I, you know i love mm. i love i fancy rats i'm a fancy rat fan like, oh. <laughs> yeah. because it, it just opens you up and and you go oh my god we're gonna get a fancy rat in the show because you will be connected to that and you will bring you know it's just again knowing their humanity will will find the things you know like i'm a professional whistler right mm. and all of a sudden you're like okay that's in the show somehow that's, that's gonna good be so so i think we can get locked into i grew up i came into the industry during sort of the height of auteur filmmaking where that was the greatest thing ever uh, and, and the truth is, it's mostly bullshit, right? Um, and the best thing you could do is to be part of the community of your film or your TV show, so that because you could pull stuff from them. Um, I, I, currently, I'm doing part of a show where one of the actresses is pregnant, and so we wrote to that because she's connected to that. She's living that, right? And you know, so the more you can stay impro improvisational and in the moment. And when the when the when the spark hits, you go ah, it's right there. I'm going to go follow that. That's where all the great stuff is, you know. Not in the stuff that you locked in place and won't and won't you know move from. Find yeah. the spark. I like that. And follow it. And follow it. Yeah. I, I don't know where the fancy rats came from. That was just weird. <laughs> <laughs> was that you're speak, you're manifesting something into the universe. Exactly. We're looking for that show with Regina King to have some sort of fancy it's rat. It's gonna have a fancy rat now. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. You know what's wild? I'm I'm writing about a rat right now. I'm writing <laughs> writing about a man transforming into a rat. So this is wild right now. Well, fancy rats are very specific rats. My kid used to have one, so I say go check that out. <laughs> Learn about the fancy rats, Christina. <laughs> I know. I'm on it. I'm on it. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Add another layer. Okay, so yeah, I'm writing a comic book right now. What are your thoughts on developing IP and adapting in this space for film and TV? It's super smart. Okay. <laughs> Angela, That's a I think up. we'll back this up. The difference between walking into a room and saying I have an idea and walking into a room and say, here's my here's my uh, uh, graphic novel is you're you're just taking a huge step. There's a thing that they can look at and a thing that they can hold that will feel real to them. And you've done a lot of the work also up front. So it's it's super smart. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, and, and it's almost important possible these days to get folks to spark to an idea there they are looking for ip like actively searching for ip as as uh, as small as a tweet like that movie that's coming out those based on a twitter thread uh, uh, articles graphic novels it, yeah absolutely. zola yeah mm -hmm. yeah i saw zola at sundance okay so yeah creating stuff and having your 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 ip your brand is only going to help you with the pitching space yep that's good that's good Thank you both. Uh, this has been so informative and so inspiring. Uh, Christine and I have so many projects we're producing and working on together. We have yet to write one together, but I know that's going to happen because we've we've talked about it, haven't we? <laughs> A little bit. We have. <laughs> but you two are so grateful, gr uh, gracious, and generous with your time, and we are grateful for you being with us today. So. Uh, thank you. We are following you and we hope that you'll come be guests on the show again. But before we leave, it's time for our favorite things of the week. 
Brave faves. TV shows, films, books, books songs, songs technology, technology, clothing, podcast, food, and more. These are a few of our favorite people, places, and things. Brave faves. All right, our girl Christina gets to start with a snack. <laughs> All right, so I shot Tony a link. I found these on Walmart, um, but you could find them in like a lot of grocery stores. So this snack is by Nora. It is a tempura seaweed snack. It's ridiculous. Go ahead and uh, jump on Walmart and get the case. The case is like 30 bucks. You're going to want a case. Because <laughs> once, you, once you smack one bag, you're going to be like, I need a... I need two, three, four more. So go ahead. Go ahead. Get yourself the case. Enjoy the snack. Don't fight with your family. And you're welcome. <laughs> but now, Christina, we're all going to buy it. There won't be any left for you, which you told us earlier. <laughs> I, I probably need to take a break. You know, anyway, I've been going so hard. But I, could spare, I could spare a case or two, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching live or on the replay, we will put that link, but go easy on it. The link is in the chat for y'all if you want to get those, yeah. those snacky <laughs> snacks. What do you got, Angela? I'm going to go with this week's episode of Top Chef, which was... Uh, Tournament of Tofu. <laughs> so, it was a lot happening in this episode where they pit chef against chef with different types of tofu and they had to do um, three rounds. It was just, it was never a dull moment. And um, I'm having a great time this season. Um, just it's one of my favorite shows. I'm in a pool. My, my chefs are doing well. <laughs> are you serious is that yeah. for real uh -huh. it's for real every season yeah you gotta pick your top three. <laughs> oh, that's getting good. put in your 20 bucks and like let's go I, I, i'm like number two in the pool right now so we'll see we'll see how it comes out that is hella fun i love <laughs> that, is so that. Fun. <laughs> jeff i got two um I'm gonna go. I'm gonna uh, stay with the theme of food. There's something called Cali Dumpling Delivery, where they will deliver you these amazing dumplings on Wednesdays, or Wednesdays at least is the West Side. So you go there and you order stuff, and and they're they're delicious and fantastic, and they're my food in the middle of the day. Um, the other is this show, this one time show of a performance on, on Hulu called In and of Itself, um, which is about four months old, and it's it's this m magician. I don't want to say anything about it. I discovered it and watched it. And it so moved me uh, because it's about being seen and how you're seen. And I just, I can't recommend it enough. It's fantastic. Don't learn anything about it. Just go, you can rent it on Hulu. It's super fantastic. Hey, okay, so love it. Okay, so mine, you know, I'm all about trying to get this film, as I said, done. And I was scrambling, like printing off storyboard sheets or just using, you know, a regular notebook and I had pieces of paper flying everywhere until I found this storyboard booklet. It's just a story. It's just, you know, a bunch of blank pages nice. for my storyboards. <laughs> and so, you know, you can see my stick figures in there. <laughs> but I got it on Amazon. It was like 15 bucks and it's my lifeline right now. So it's called the Storyboard Notebook 16 by 9. I recommend it. It's been super helpful to me. And that's our Brave Faves for the week. Don't go away, Angela and Jeff. Uh, we are so grateful for everybody watching today. June 5th, today is our launch day for the Brave Maker Film Festival. We encourage you, go to our website and check out all of the selections, bravemaker.com. If you're not on our email list, you can go to bravemaker.com slash buzz and sign up. So you'll get all of the notifications about when we are launching new concepts, our new short films or classes. We have screenwriting workshops, all these things coming up. Uh, you're going to hear about Christina's uh, music video that we're producing this summer. You'll get the... You'll be the first to know about her comic book when it comes out if you are on bravemaker.com. And those of you know, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We exist to elevate brave stories for justice, diversity, and inclusion. And your donations and financial support, corporate sponsorships help us do this work. Literally get us the gear and the microphones and the webcams and all that kind of stuff. We're really grateful. We can also mentor up and coming uh, filmmakers, we have a fiscal sponsorship program right now, currently with five filmmaking projects by women and people of color that we're really proud to be a part of. So go to our website, bravemaker.com and join. You can even use your phone to text the word BRAVEMAKER to 44321. Well, Jeffrey 
And Angela, this is so awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks for having us. It's really, fun. really a pleasure. It was fun. so fun. Yeah. yeah. Heck yeah. Thanks to sort of meet. Yeah, and you two meeting each other. Uh, yes. I, I'm gonna go to the valley you. just to meet Angela. So that's I will. I that's nice. a, a trek I'm willing to take, or or wherever you are <laughs> inland. I don't and know. You, LA, you have to be from LA to understand what a compliment that is. So <laughs> yeah. Basically, he's willing yeah. to say he'll sit in traffic for you. Basically, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That is which, is, which is which is which is right underneath or right above, right underneath picking someone up from the airport in LA. So that's that's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you to stay after. We would love to grab a quick screenshot picture with you, Christina, and I always end our show with our tagline brave stories change the world and you are the story goodbye everybody follow us on instagram twitter, twitter YouTube, youtube and facebook, and facebook at, brave at brave maker, maker org. org like subscribe and share. To become a monthly donor, text the word Brave Maker to 44321 or go to bravemaker.com slash donate. Thanks for tuning in.